Well, hello and welcome to Her Hollywood Highlights with me, Lexi McKinney, and the one, the only, Joe Johnson. Hey, thanks for having me, Lexi. Well, thanks for joining me. So this is the first episode. It's Halloween. So very, very happy Halloween to all the listeners. We are so grateful to have you with us. So a little backstory on Her Hollywood Highlights. This is the one-stop podcast exploring all different genres of films. And of course, what I think are some of the most iconic films over the years that I have just grown to love and constantly like reiterate the lines of all my favorite characters. And it's just the best. So it's very exciting because Joe Johnson right here with me today, um, and I have been talking about movies since I started my internship, honestly, which was back in what, May, which is crazy. And so I had this like awesome idea that I love movies and I love to talk about movies and how they make me feel Um, and everything that goes into production is just so fascinating. So I really wanted to kind of make a a framework, a a state of mind where I can talk about these things, get some other input from him. And he's met and seen some really cool things in movie history. So I can't wait to hear all of his uh, input in what he gets to experience, and he's going to bring the spunk because he specializes <laughs> in a lot of these cool films. Well, but- you know, my uh, when I was a kid, uh, going to the Dollar Show mm-hmm. uh, was a cheap form of entertainment for my mom, who was raising four kids by herself. And so almost any given weekend, my family was in a movie theater growing up. Yeah. Now, she was from Spain, and she kind of had that European mentality where she just let us see anything and everything. Really? And so I've seen just about everything. And <laughs> movies have always been a part of my life. And, you know, growing up in Michigan in the Midwest, you kind of put Hollywood on this pedestal. It's like this magical place that's yeah. unreachable. But then all of a sudden I'm like, hey, I want to go to L.A. And you go to L.A. and find out it's a place you can go. It's a place you can visit and and experience that other side that you don't really get growing up in the Midwest. It's You're so right. It, when I went to Hollywood, L.A., when I was younger, I was in fourth grade. I remember it because it was like the most exciting field trip. And I had this idea, Joe, that I was going to make like my own movie and send it to Hollywood. And I thought that everything was going to be okay after that. Like no stress, no hassle of how old are you in fourth grade is going to produce her (laughs) own film. And that was going to be it. But then you go there and you just experience what it's like. And it's such a surreal feeling. Like I can't even describe it other than surreal because it just feels so magical. And you just see all of the different avenues, the streets that you dream about that you just I don't know. It connects you to reality of movies. It's not too late to do that film. You could still do that film and get the attention of Hollywood. Get the attention of Hollywood. That would be the goal. I don't even know what kind of movie. Maybe Scream? Uh, My own Scream? There you go. I don't know. uh, There was talk that there was going to be uh, another Scream added, the final edition of Scream, but something happened with uh, some of the actresses in the recent sequels and so there's all this drama but maybe who knows i'll make the the scream franchise one day 20 years down the line (laughs) a whole different plot um and somehow connect it but yeah that's what we're talking about today for the first movie is scream which honestly you were just saying what was that statement that you made before we started about what scream did to the horror it brought back the slasher slash uh pardon the pun a horror genre (laughs) where it had you know the 80s we describe the 80s as the golden age of slasher flicks and horror films. Some of the best, cheesiest slasher flicks came out in the 80s. And then there's kind of this overkill where people got a little tired of the slasher flick and it kind of went away for a little bit. And then all yeah. of a sudden, this little movie comes along in the 90s that is a fan of slasher flicks and <laughs> breaks down the rules and how things are supposed to play out in slasher flicks, all while the characters are are part of a slasher Slasher flick. It was so Mm -hmm. surreal, uh, but it was so clever and so well done that it, it, you know, re-energized the genre and and a new generation of people discovered it. I think what's cool about it too is that there was never a film that had the same type of concepts that it did establish. And Mm -hmm. I guess at the time in the 90s, you, you didn't really look at a film and break it down the same way as I might now or somebody that's interested in films might now. Because you don't appreciate things until you watch, you know, 
ghost face uh, <laughs> and how he interacts. And, of course, the reveal at the end is like the <gasps> jaw-dropping moment. Who did it? Who done it? Why did they do it? What connections do they have? Yeah. And, honestly, just the base of it, we've got Billy Loomis, and he's my favorite <laughs> ghost face. I mean, he's the most iconic. And when you get the backstory, I mean, you see him in the chemistry between – Sydney, and you're like, okay, they're meant to be. But then uh, when you watch it a few times, and of course TikTok is my one-stop shop to watching um, different clues, or sometimes people will go out there and say, this was a flaw in the film. Like, this is how you knew he was ghost face. Mm -hmm. And it's like these little details, and you go back and you're like, I didn't even think about that. Like, you're just thinking about all these different pieces of a puzzle coming together when you see it for the first time. And I really love how every Scream movie was like that, that feeling of going into it, and you have to figure out who done it and what the connections are. Before we go any further, if you haven't seen Scream, I'm sure this podcast is going to be full of spoilers, so let us yeah. warn you right now. Red but flag. there are some very clever twists in Scream, mm -hmm. and which kind of help explain how Ghostface could be in, you know, two places at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a very clever twist on the reveal, you know, the Scooby-Doo reveal where you pull the mask <laughs> off and go, it's you, old man Loomis, you know. What's so iconic is, um, what's his name? Oh, my goodness. Matthew Lillard was uh, Shaggy in Scooby-Doo, and you just That's used right. that. I love that. That was so a great I connection. <laughs> so I, I want to ask you this. What do you think about, so we know the opening scene, and we know that the voice uh, the voice disguise of Ghostface is, is just something iconic because now when you see people's Halloween costumes, they're always trying to incorporate that. Yeah. But what were your essential thoughts when you've got the first opening scene in Scream, and how were you like, this is going to set the movie up for a lot of questions for me. What yeah. do you think? So the the most one of the most fascinating things about the movie is prior to its release, it really made no secret that Drew Barrymore was in the movie. And I yeah. think a lot of people were excited to see Drew Barrymore in this slasher flick. So we all went in and, you know, here's Drew in the opening sequences. And then about 10 minutes into it, you're like, what now? What, what just happened here? Is what she, went wrong? Is she okay? Is yeah. she going to be okay? And it was a jaw dropper. It was a game changer that this star mm -hmm. uh, who was heavily promoted in the film, she's the face on the poster with the yeah. wide with eyes. the wide eyes and the... <gasps> and it was, it was, it kind of paid homage to Psycho yep. because Janet uh, Lee was in Psycho and she was billed as the star of Psycho, but she met her demise fairly early on in the film. Spoiler alert. Uh, so Scream, which, you know, again, pays tribute to all the slasher and horror flicks that came before it, I think kind of took a page from Psycho and, and promoted this star that was going to be in this movie and then had everyone, like, not knowing what to expect once they, you realized that they were going to off their star at the beginning of the movie. And it's so it's so different because when you have a name like Drew Barrymore, right, she is this icon and she continues to be. She's a beautiful woman. She's a very talented actress. She's got so many great things. But yes, no movie before Scream ever <laughs> killed off the star like that. Yeah. But what I think is my favorite part about the opening scene and what always sticks with me is that it's like such a real scenario of what you're afraid of, right? Is oh, like yeah. there's that stereotype of, you know, you're home alone and you're talking on a phone with a stranger and you're like thinking the worst, right? It's kind of creepy. It's eerie. It's dark out. Like that would be so me is, uh, you know, just kind of freaking out and panicking and she doesn't realize. But um, I don't, I know that you haven't seen some of the new Scream, but I really like how, uh, what's the Scream? It's the first Scream where they kind of did like the rebrand, which I think was in like 2022 maybe or 2021. Okay. And they, they use the opening scene very similarly, but also different. You see much more fighting, much more um, trying to figure out what they're doing here. Are they just remaking the original Scream? Because it's very yeah. similar, right? Except it, it has kind of tributes to different horror films nowadays, right? So it's, it's a little bit more updated version. But that's just something so iconic, and you see the spoofs, and you see so many people reenacting that scene. Um, yeah, and it well, it together. You know, the problem with the the sequels is, you know, Scream was so original and had some great twists that the sequels were like, you know, how do we up our game? How do we give somebody something new but still give them what they expect? And so the sequels have sort of become this, well, how do we give a twist or how do we do a twist that shocks everybody? And that seems to be the motivation for doing these films is trying to 
come up with variations on the first film. And mm -hmm. so obviously none of the sequels are going to be as good as the first one. And I think the, the last one I saw was the, the last one that Nev Campbell did. She's going to okay. be coming back to the franchise. Yeah. But the last one that she was in, I didn't really care for it all that much because it lacked a lot of the fun of the first one, the playfulness. Mm -hmm. uh, they just tried to be very graphic. There's some scenes that come to mind that just really kind of turned me off. Yeah. So I'm not a fan of the sequels. I am intrigued that Nev is going to be coming back because she took a movie off because of a pay dispute. You were alluding to that at the beginning mm -hmm. of the podcast. Uh, there was a pay dispute. Uh, so she sat one out and they said, okay, we can't do this without her. So they, they made, uh, an offer she couldn't refuse. So she's going to be coming back for, I think seven, maybe. Um, so yeah, so the sequels, and this goes for just about any movie, they never really live up to the original. The original is always going to be a classic. So, and it's always hard because, uh, for me, Billy Loomis was like the icon. That was my crush, right? When I saw <laughs> him, I was like, oh, he's crazy. But then the other thing is that you see in the sequels later on that the motives change a lot. And I know that they kind of had to do that so it's not the same story repeated. But some of them were really great. Like when it was Billy Loomis's mom in the second Scream, like mm -hmm. totally great way to bring her into it and have like an actual demeanor. But some of them, uh, some of the newer ones that you'll see, uh, I really, it's like it was a little bit more obvious where I think some of the older movies, it's not as obvious. Yeah. Maybe, maybe that's just me thinking about it. But some of it, you know, it's it's the new kid. It's the roommate. It's the, and spoiler alert, and kind of spoiler to you, I won't say <laughs> who the other screams are because there's actually three in that one. But yeah. um, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's a different way of doing it. But I really am curious what the last one's going to curtail. And part of me wishes that, I mean, I know that Billy Loomis's daughter is like the key character. Mm -hmm. And in the recent one, you actually see flashbacks um, and you see kind of, these moments of monologue and then dialogue between his daughter and him, like in a flashback, like he's visiting her. Mm. Um, and I, I like that connection because it, it kind of has a little bit more of an overlaying process. There's more detail in it. You have to think about things. It makes good connections. Um, but for me, one thing I wanted to talk about, which I don't even know if you know this fun fact. Or maybe you do. So you know how the ghost face mask and he's got the black cape on or mm -hmm. whoever's ghost face has the black cape on. It was originally supposed to be white. Did you know that? No, I didn't know that. Yeah, so when they were starting everything with the series and, of course, developing the production and the costumes and what, of course, characters are going to develop and how they're going to develop or if they're going to be killed off right away, whatever the case may be, poor Rip Drew Barrymore. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it was supposed to be white because it was supposed to be more of a ghost. A ghostly figure, yeah. Yes, but, of course, I think that they realized the depth and, and everything and they wanted to change that element and... I'm glad they did because, man, it's one of my favorite costumes. I mean, that and Michael Myers, the two, I think, creepiest in my opinion. Yeah. Jason just felt, I don't know, he was missing <laughs> something to me. Something was missing, but I understood that he, he was a really good killer. And Freddy, I don't know. I just never got into the nightmare before. It was or cool nightmare. in the 80s. That was fun. I got a trivia question for you. Do you oh, know no. the original name before they settled on Scream? What was the movie going to be called oh. before it was called Scream? Not stab? No. What? What was? It? What was it? You said this I, before. I think to I, me. Now you got me wondering because because stab was the name of the movie that was based on the incidents that happened in the movie, right? Right. I seem to recall reading that the movie was originally going to be called Scary Movie, and then uh, you might have to verify this, but I think it was going to be called Scary Movie. Then they went with Scream, but then when they did the parody of Scream, they called they that one Scary Movie. So. I might have to verify that, but that's what no, I seem to I, recall reading. I actually reading. didn't know that. I assumed it was Stab because I figured that they were just going to kind of make that connection. Yeah. You know, even if they didn't use it for the actual movie. Um, I'm Googling. Let's see what the internet <laughs> says. Yeah, oh, scary movie. There you go. See, wow. I know stuff. He knows a few I'm things. The guy. See. So speaking of this, though, I really do want to make this connection because I feel like we kind of have to. Um, if you know Joe Johnson as well as I do now, Joe Johnson seems to be at the right place at the right time almost all the time when it comes to movies and seeing iconic cars and people and everything. And, and filming so, locations. And filming locations. That's the other thing is, do you know, actually, I'm going to ask you this. Do you know where the house is from the Scream movie? Not off the top of my head. It's not here in Michigan, is it? It's No, it's, 
I'll have I would have to look that up. I know it's a place that fans of the movie visit. I just don't remember what the address is, but California. It is in California. It's in California. Okay. I'll have yeah. to add that to my list. Man, well, it says it was rebuilt. Uh, it looks like during Scream Three, so it seems uh-huh. like I don't know. It gives an address, so I would definitely uh yeah want to pop by that, but. Anyway, going back to our connections, you've actually met some of the characters from Scream. Is this right? Yeah, and it's not something I deliberately set out to do. Uh, a year or two ago, I decided to rewatch the original Scream for Halloween. And as mm-hmm. I was watching the film, it dawned on me. I'm like, well, I've met that person. And then as I'm watching the movie, I'm like, I've met that person and that person and that person. And I'm up to at least six actors now that uh, were in the Scream movies. Now, the first cast member that I met was long before Scream. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was uh, living in L.A. Some friends came to visit. I took them to Venice Beach. Okay. And a long black limo pulled up and a bunch of teenagers got out. And uh, it looked like they were having a party. And one of the people that stepped out of the limo was Drew Barrymore. And not a lot of people recognized her because she hadn't, it, she was, had been like an ET and fire starter and stuff like that. But yeah, she hadn't done the real big mainstream stuff that came later. And so my buddy just happened to have a camera. So I said, Hey, get your camera ready. And I walked over to her and said, can I get a picture with you, Miss Barrymore? And she said, yes, of course. And she was all smiles and very sweet. And so I got a picture with her and then all her friends were like, ah, like teasing her and stuff. Um, So that was my first experience. Of course, she went on later to do Scream. Mm -hmm. Uh, But then I, uh, an uncredited role in Scream, which is interesting. Uh, I think he was the principal, was Henry Winkler, Mm -hmm. who uh, played Fonzie on Happy Days and have done a lot of stuff Mm -hmm. since then. Uh, I've met him several times. He's been at the Autorama and the Motor City Comic Con, and uh, we keep crossing paths for some reason. Maybe I've met him multiple times. There must be some reason. Maybe you're going to produce a, I don't even know. It's <laughs> I don't know. Johnson. It's just a universal, uh, universal thing. But yeah. And then uh, some friends of mine, when I was visiting LA, we went to a comedy club, the uh, Hollywood improv. And one of the performers that night was a guy named Jamie Kennedy. Oh and goodness. he was nice enough after the show to hang out and take pictures. And so He's the guy who presents in the film all the rules of the horror of the film. Horror and film yeah. Never be, you know, never say I'll be right back. back you know, that sort yeah. of stuff. Uh, but then the big one, I mm-hmm. never thought I would have an opportunity to meet her. But the big one, of course, was Nev Campbell. Oh, uh, my goodness, yeah. Sydney. She was at the Motor City Comic Con a number of years ago. And I was there working. I was shooting video. But I also wanted just an opportunity to meet her and get a photo with her. So I didn't have my gear with me. I stood in line. I paid money to get a photo with her. She was very sweet. Mm -hmm. And then the next day, uh, we were walking around with my my gear, and the Comic-Con people said, do you want to interview with Neff Campbell? And I'm like, I'd be surprised if she agreed to it, but you could ask. So they approached her. They said, this guy wants to do an interview with you. And uh, she said, yeah, bring him over. So So we went over and did did the interview. So Joe was so gracious enough to actually <laughs> let us use that interview with Nev on the podcast today. Great way to start off this podcast. So thank you so much. So you're hearing it right now. The very one and only interview with Nev Campbell and Joe Johnson. What's it like having people come up and tell you how much your work means to them? It's pretty amazing. I think as a screen actor, you don't get that immediate response from an audience like you do when you're on stage. For So for us to, to come out and meet the fans and hear their opinions and see how we have some kind of an impact is, is really lovely. Speaking of impact, let's talk about the Scream franchise, what it did for the horror genre and what it meant to you in your career. Everything. Um, for the horror genre, they, you know, it's it said that it brought the genre back. I think there had been a big lull in horror films, and we were lucky that we hit at the right time and made a good movie, and Kevin Williamson and Wes Craven as a combo were just incredibly bright with what they did with the film, with sort of making a horror film with a wink at the horror film genre at the same time. It was very intelligent. Um, so that was exciting, and for me, you know, it was my first lead in a movie, and it did really well, so I was lucky. It looked fun. It was a lot of fun. We had a blast on these movies. 
So yeah, that was a genuine thrill to actually have a conversation with her. And yeah, since then, uh, Skeet Ulrich, your guy, and Matthew Lillard My have guy. come to the Motor City Comic Con, and yeah, uh, so I snapped some photos of them, and they they just have so much fun with their fans. Yeah, you know, a lot of times when you go to these comic cons, some of the stars stay behind their table. You pay yeah. for a photo or an autograph, and they sign the thing, and it's like an assembly line. But those two guys, they're not sitting behind their table. They're mingling. They're they're hugging. Their handshakes, photos. It was really cool to watch those two guys interact with their fans. It is too, and I think that their personality. Uh, you know, in the movie, they obviously have a goofy relationship a little bit. I mean, it, it you just see it, and I think <laughs> they had good chemistry going into it. And it's so great that they know how iconic Scream will always be to generations. Um, now in in generations in the past too. I mean, for me. I didn't get to live through when it came out, but man, when I hear stories of what it was like to see this movie, oh, oh it was a blast! It, so like I jealous. said, it, you know, horror movies, slasher films had kind of gone away, and mm-hmm. this brought it all back, and it was a thrill to watch this movie in the theater. It's just the cleverest way to take a horror movie and basically lay out why we like horror movies. I yeah. mean, that's really what it was. Is it was a way for us to say, hey, what makes a really good horror movie? Because you can see so many plots. I mean, nowadays there's so many horror movies that come out. Um, I believe there's one called Smile that came out, and I haven't yeah. seen it yet. But I hear things about it, and I guess I had a, assumptions of it following kind of this this one plot line that a lot of movies similar have followed. Then I hear what pertained in the second Smile, and everyone's like, oh, my goodness, you have to see it. <laughs> it brings back to life what we want in horror films. And I'm thinking, huh. well, that's what, what Scream was to a lot of people back in the 90s. Yeah. So uh, it's really, really interesting to to see that. I but, do have a question for you. Mm-hmm. What's your favorite horror movie? My favorite <laughs> horror movie, Joe Johnson. It's Halloween. I oh, okay. Let me ah, think. Okay. Um. Well, I'll tell you this. I have a couple different and a couple different reasons for it. I love Scream because I love the idea, but I've seen all the Scream and they blend together a little bit. Like after the second Scream, the other ones. I I remember the one with it's Emma Roberts, right? She I was don't go- remember. Oh, you don't remember? Well, she was Sydney's cousin, and oh. they had a really great fight scene. So that's what <laughs> I kind of want to be partial, but also because Billy Loomis just really brought for me. He was the best ghost face, and I, I don't know why. I think maybe I was uh, in awe of just his personality, his persona, even though he was a psychopath, basically. But I love the screen movies for that. But I just think that Jamie Lee Curtis in Halloween, the whole, the whole storyline and backstory between Michael Myers, his family, what happened to him as a child, and what carried on throughout his lifetime, and how she just lives through it every single time. Uh, I love the Halloween movies. I love Michael Myers. Yeah, they kind of set the standard for everything that came afterward, Friday the 13th, and all that stuff that came after that. But surprisingly, it wasn't necessarily the first one to delve into that. Um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre came out before that. And a movie that I saw when I was way too young. I was 10 (laughs) years old when I saw a movie called The Town That Dreaded Sundown. And the scariest thing about that particular movie is it's based on actual events. Events that happened. Yeah. Yeah. So there were a couple of movies that came out before Halloween, but Halloween, like, checked off all the boxes of what you should expect in a horror movie, a slasher flick. And everybody's just been trying to imitate Halloween ever since then. I don't think they'll ever get it. They have the theme song, too. It's just like Ghostface has Ghostface, right? That is the symbol (laughs) of the film. And the symbol, too, is that you can reiterate lines. You know the iconic scene in the beginning with Drew Barrymore. You know how it's going to end with Sydney. And and you just see things play out where, for me, Halloween, there's one thing, and I always talk about this with my dad, and that's just the fact that the Halloween, for whatever reason, it always – Like, I have to watch it. No matter how many times I see it, it never gets old for me. And my dad says the same thing, and I don't know why we're like this, but, like, he bought this blow-up the other day for me, and it's a Michael Myers. I'll have to send you a picture. (laughs) And he's got, like, a bobblehead. He's, like, one of those fathead Michael Myers. But there's just something about it. I don't know. I I just love watching it. It never really was scary to me just because I've watched them so many times I knew what would happen. But the new, again, watching the newer ones, you have such great expectations of the older ones that watching the new ones, you have a hard time appreciating them. And it's not that they were bad films or anything, but I watched the most recent Halloween, which I believe was the last Halloween that they were using with Jamie Lee Curtis. And I don't, have you watched it at all? 
not not that one. My my favorite Halloween movie after the original was uh, Halloween H two O. Okay, it was uh, released on the twentieth anniversary of Halloween, and they mm-hmm. did bring Jamie Lee back for that for particular that film. And mm-hmm. I love that one, but I really haven't seen any other ones that have come out since. The new one, um, I don't want to spoil too much, but I kind of have to say this because it does make me still think. I saw it in theater. I believe I actually saw it the day it came out. I had to get those tickets because I was so excited. And you saw so many people, again, just like when you the, the new reboots of Scream came out, is everyone was wearing their favorite T-shirts and really enacting and mm-hmm. bringing this like theater full of pe- like-minded people that just love a good classic horror film. But for me, it, it the storyline kind of set up that even though Michael Myers was not going to make it, basically there's going to be a final battle between him and Jamie Lee Curtis, and it was going to be the the sibling rivalry that we all have been waiting for and just an end to it finally, an end to the madness. <laughs> but you do see Michael have a soft side for one character that he hmm. does not kill immediately and has multiple opportunities to. Interesting. And what I love about it is that this character, I think, reminded Michael of himself because it's a very similar story. The character killed somebody, right, and completely changed who he was. And then he believes that he's this dark, like, supposed to be Michael. And he starts to try to be Michael. And then we see how that goes for him. But I was like, that would have been the coolest way to spin off the Halloween series is if Michael let this guy live. And we the see new, who, yeah. like, what's his name going to be? Is he going to be Michael Myers 2.0? I don't <laughs> think you can replace Michael Myers. Uh, yeah. He might hunt you down on Halloween night. I don't know. But <laughs> it, it, it just makes me excited to see what you can do with films. And, oh, goodness, what I would do to be on the set of one of these horror films. Well, I think I told you that there's a, there's a neighborhood in Pasadena where you can visit the filming locations of the original Halloween. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think they moved one of the houses. Maybe it was... Uh, Michael Myers house I think got moved but you can still visit uh, Laurie Strode's house and yeah. the neighborhood and the babysitter's house and all that stuff so that's, that's on my to-do list it's always too uh, you know the scene what Halloween is this in where she's like looking out the window and she sees Michael kind of in the, the standing curtains. yeah the curtain yeah yeah I that scene for some reason every time the the fall crisp air comes it, I just think to that scene because I can just envision what it was like and that's what I would imagine and for her character too it's like she never caught a break but again it's yeah. what makes it good I know we went off on a tangent but there's just so much <laughs> good horror stuff to talk about nowadays uh, I want to end this with hearing a little bit of input from Joe on this topic so back to scream what is one thing about Scream that you would change if you could change anything? about? We'll, we'll just talk about the original because it gets really too complicated with all of them. But what's one thing that you think could have improved the film, if anything? You know, uh, you would think I'd have an answer ready for that, but I don't. <laughs> uh, if, if you were to have a podcast on the perfect movies mm-hmm. that have, you know, not a lot you can complain about, I think Scream is very close to a perfect movie. <gasps> I really do. There's not a whole lot I would change. I love the twists. I love everything about it. There's no part of that movie where I get bored or get mm-hmm. upset. Um, you asking that question makes me wonder, is, do you find flaw in the film? Because I think it's it's uh, pretty close to perfect. I don't find a ton of flaw, but there's one thing, and I think you're, I've already kind of touched on it, what my answer would be. I just would have wanted Billy Loomis to survive. And there's so <laughs> many reasons why. There's so many ideas in my head of what we could have done in the series with him back um, in different ways. But, I mean, again, the newer films, they do bring him back. They bring his ghost back, if hmm. you will, kind of iconic. Um, it, and they basically, he teaches his daughter through these, moments of her dreaming about him and envisioning him in a scenario they teach how to be the perfect killer in a movie basically and he like re goes through all the rules which i think is kind of a fun way to do it but there's just so much potential and he just he's just the face when you go on tiktok it's so crazy how many females post videos and just these uh different edits together of him and they're like this is the reason that I like horror film was just because he played such a perfect ghost face. But I want to give credit to Sydney too, because her character has seen so much development throughout the franchise. Mm-hmm. And how many times can you be in fights with these crazy psychopaths and what, what's the motive behind it and who's your friend group going to be? And how many times can you trust new people? <laughs> yeah. That's my question for her is if I could ask yeah. 
her character, uh, Nev's character, anything. How many times are you going to let this happen before you just say, I'm going to buy myself a private island and head elsewhere by myself? <laughs> <laughs> because I couldn't do it much longer. Yeah. Now, uh, you know, if I were to uh, point out one thing in the film mm -hmm. that might come across as a flaw, in reality, it's it's part of the whole uh, appeal of the movie. But, like, you know, Nev is being attacked in a home, Sydney. But instead of, like, running out the front door, she runs up the stairs. Yeah. Now, someone might say, well, why don't you just leave the house? That's the whole point of the movie is yeah. that people in slasher films don't do the things that normal, rational people would do. So mm -hmm. you say, well, that's a flaw, but it's not. It's part of the charm of the movie. It'd be interesting to see. I'm sure there is a movie out there. I, I don't know of one, but that goes against the, the stereotypes of that, right? Yeah. Like the running away or the common tripping right in front of right in front before the killer comes to catch you because you know that there's some slow serial killers in these movies i mean yeah, come right. on let's be real michael myers is gonna put his tennis shoes on and chase after you no <laughs> you're just slow in the movies because you're just not moving quick enough to get out of his way if you want to if you want to watch a, a slasher flick that takes the whole genre and turns it on its head mm -hmm. uh you got to see a movie called the uh, tucker and dale versus evil uh, yeah. It is okay. outstanding. It's, is it? It's funny it, it, in the way that Scream is funny, mm -hmm. um, but it takes the whole genre and just Flips does it. a big 180. <laughs> so maybe tonight, if you can find it on Apple or something like that, watch Tucker and Dale versus Tucker Evil. Dale. Who knows? I might like it so much we talk about it in weeks to come. Wink, go. wink, nudge, nudge. Well, this has been the first episode of Her Hollywood Highlights, and what a blast. We covered Scream, and what we love about this Her Hollywood Highlights podcast is that we talk about all genres. This is horror this week, but next week we're going to be talking about Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, which is one of my favorite movies. And guess what? Joe Johnson has a very special comment uh, <laughs> to make about something that he got to witness about this movie when it was in production. Yeah. And so we get to cover every single week what we love about it, maybe what we don't love about it. Uh, these are all of my favorite movies, but Joe might say, mm, I don't know. Right now, we're we're one for one. We both agree Scream oh, is an iconic classic. Yep. We both agree that Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is also a classic in its own I way. I will agree. Um, and it's got so many things that we need to dissect about it because, oh my goodness, I could talk for days. And uh, it's going to be exciting. So we will see you next time. Thanks so much. We got to hear a very special, unique interview with Nev Campbell and Joe Johnson. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thanks for having me. And uh, we'll see you next time to discuss all the galore about Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. <laughs> ¶¶